Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this next lecture on this course uh, which is titled as Development Process and Social Movement in India. Uh, today's lecture is uh, titled as Parliament and State Assemblies. We all are aware of the fact that when India got its independence in 1947, it was a very challenging time for India in many ways. Of course, the long history of colonial exploitation of its economic resources was there at the back of the mind when the leaders, the political leaders came together under one roof in the constituent assembly to discuss and debate the possibilities of starting a new future for India. It was through the provision of a new constitution that the political leaders thought of starting India's new adventure into the realm of post-independent Asian and African continents. It was in this process that India engaged with its own diversities, its own historical past, its own experiences through British colonialism and its own understanding of the idea of modern political institutions, social institutions, economic institutions as well as judicial institutions. It was through long debate and discussion in the constituent assembly that finally India came out with the proposition of parliamentary democracy in India. And within this framework of parliamentary democracy in India, which was based on liberal principles of liberty, equality, justice and fraternity, that India finally decided to have a bicameral legislative system in India. But this system which India adopted largely deriving from the experience of British parliamentary system also had its own history in the ancient and medieval times in terms of experiencing the process of organizing some kind of bodies which are supposed to legislate and enact laws. In addition, India was also well aware of the fact that the kind of diversities the kind of challenges India has in this vast land needs to be accommodated and thus it is very pertinent that India should have at least two houses, one representing the will of the people and directly while on the other hand there should be another chamber which should reflect the aspirations and wishes of different regions of this country. It was in this process and with this aim that India ventured on to experiment with a new possibility and that is the parliamentary system of democracy in India. If you look into this whole idea of parliament, we need to understand that this idea of parliament has its vast meaning and this meaning has its roots of course in the colonial experiences as well as in India's own interaction with its own reality during the colonial movement and during the India's independence movement. Independent India has long claimed and with much justification to be the world's largest democracy. We all know and often repeated that India is the largest democracy. When we say that India is the largest democracy, precisely we are trying to indicate and underline that India is largest in terms of the population and the number of people who get representation in the parliament through their uh, uh, member of parliaments that India is the largest democracy and here all the adults have the voting right. If you look into the aggregate number of these voting rights, we can safely say that yes, India is proudly the world's largest democracy. And of course, with the exception of internal emergency which was imposed in 1975 till 1977, we have otherwise a very bright past of experimenting and experiencing this whole parliamentary democratic forms 
and the varying incidents of socio-economic violence which India has witnessed in all these years post-independence, they were very marginal and small in number in comparison to the success which India achieved through its parliamentary democracy. Some of the key writings of Nirja Gopal Jayal and of uh, Pratap Bhanu Mehta of Paul Baras. If you look into all their uh, readings and understanding of Indian politics, we can reach to this conclusion that India's experiment and experience of parliamentary democracy has so far been successful, largely successful. And the main reason behind this kind of experience is precisely because India has engaged with its own socio-economic and political realities with very open mind. If you look into the working of the parliament in India, you find that it showcases the changing socio-economic and cultural backgrounds of the representatives who sit in the legislature. Now, this is very important aspect and interesting aspect of the parliamentary system in India that if one need to understand the socio-economic conditions of this country, you need not to go far and just look into the backgrounds of all the representatives of the parliament since independence and you will find that the kind of changes and India has undergone in different decades and under different regimes or different governments, similar kind of changes you will get its reflection in our parliamentary system and in our parliaments. The, the nature or the dynamics of caste representation in our parliament, the representation of gender in our parliaments, the representation of minorities in our parliament, you will find that all sorts of reflections are clearly there and they are very parallel or simultaneous to the kind of changes which the India has undergone in last so many decades. And it is through the understanding of parliament that we examine how and in what ways they mirror India highly pluralistic social order. And thus one can safely say that uh, if one need to understand the pluralistic nature of India's uh, socio-economic dynamics, then one can easily get into understanding of the social background of parliamentarians in India. As we will see in the later part of the lecture that how the overall changes which have ha happened in 70s and 80s and in 90s in terms of the kind of economic transformations, the kind of social transformations, the emergence of other backward classes in the Indian politics, more so in North India, you will find that immediately the dynamics of the number of parliaments, parliamentarians who are entering into the parliament are coming from these caste groups. And thus, one can say that in India, it is the parliament which is the true representative of the socio-economic transformations in the long run. In addition, parliament seeks to check executive powers and influence policy. And this is another aspect of parliamentary system in India that it is not only the reflective of the mood and the aspiration of the people who are down there, but it has also successfully so far transformed the policy making process in India. It has influenced the executive in a major way. Parliament has time and again pushed the government, bargained with the government and has made sure that the interest of the people whom this parliament is representing is always secured and taken care of. And it is in that context that parliament has always influenced the policy of India. On the other hand, the effectiveness in translating representation in, into policy as Jayal has underlined is very important. One need to understand that parliament as an institution has not only aggregated the interest of the people, it has not only articulated the interest of the people, it has also translated those aggregations and coming together of the interest into the policy formulations and this has been successfully done time and again in the last seven decades. The institutions of parliamentary government are an established element in Indian political culture, structuring the forms and idioms of social and cultural activity. Now, this is again very important to understand that the institutions of parliamentary government in India, which have established an element 
of Indian political culture, structuring the forms and idioms of social and cultural activity that this parliament as an institution has time and again coined new terms and it has also appropriated interesting terms from the social world in order to articulate those new idioms or the old idioms of our cultural background or our social background in order to shape our understanding of political ethos of this country. If we look into the origin of the parliamentary system in India, we find that the parliamentary system in India has undergone diverse changes. It has evolved over a period of time during the, during the colonial period. Then during the independence movement last leg, we find that there was lots of negotiation in terms of which form of government will be most suitable for Indian political and social and economic realities. And in post-independent India even, the parliamentary system in India has continuously evolved. If you look into the full-fledged parliamentary system of government with its concomitant institutional framework as a gift of the Republican constitution of 1950, but we have to keep in mind that the representative institutions and democratic traditions have all along been an integral part of India's rich heritage. Now, this is something important to understand that the parliamentary form of government in India is actually the offshoot of the fact that there is particular kind of constitution which India adopted and enacted in 1950 and that was the republican form of constitution. When we say that we adopted a republican form of institution and constitution for ourselves, that precisely means that we decided to have our head of the country chosen by the people. And it is through this mechanism of the direct elections and representation of people's will through parliament and through the head of that parliament in the form of president and the executive head in the form of the prime minister that we adopted a particular kind of form of government. And that form of government actually expresses India's democratic traditions along with it also showcases the integral part of India's rich heritage. If you look into the roots of this, our democratic institutions, which date back to the Vedic period, uh, which is about 3000 old uh, BC onwards, then the, when we had the experiments and experiences of popular assemblies, then one can safely say that the ethos of democracy and our experience of enacting and engaging with those institutions which have contributed significantly in terms of shaping the democratic path of this country, then those roots of those experiences goes back to as old as 3000 BC. We have ample amount of examples from our ancient Hindu text, ancient Buddhist and Jain text to claim this fact that India had a very rich tradition of representative democratic institutions in the form of sabhas and samitis. The tradition of republicanism flourished in various parts of the country for nearly 16 centuries from 1000 BC to 680. Many of the historians have time and again underlined the fact that India had a very rich tradition of experiencing the political democratic forms and, and starting from 1000 BC to 680. And during this time, most of the states in India represented and run their government through different setups, including the sabhas and samitis, as the representative forms of government structures. The popular assemblies like samiti, which was an assembly of people's representatives, and the sabha as a smaller selected bodies of elders functioned for disposing of public business through consultations, discussion and debate. Now, this is important to understand that the two institutions were very important in the ancient time as representative of people's will. One was what we call as samitis, which were the body of uh, assembly of people who were directly elected by the common people. On the other hand, there was another higher institution that was sabha, 
which was a smaller selected body of elders. We can safely draw the parallelity between Samiti and Lok Sabha on the one hand and Sabha and Rajya Sabha or the higher uh, body of Indian Parliament on the other hand. And they function for disposing of public business through following three and these three are again very important in terms of understanding that how deep the democratic roots were there during the ancient time in India. One was the consultation, other the dis discussion and third the debate and these three as we know are the bedrock of parliamentary system in India. Moving on, we also see that democracy at the grassroots thrived in the form of panchayats and gram sabhas which continued to flourish through ancient and medieval periods till the advent of British rule. If you look into the socio-political history of India since ancient times, you very often come across these two terms that is panchayats and gram sabhas. And these panchayats and gram sabhas were always the representative of people's aspirations and their choices. They were the democratic bodies which were functioning at the grassroots level at the most micro level in the villages and they always functioned as the most well oiled machineries of the state to deliver justice at the grassroots level. And all this worked till the advent of the British rule. It was only after the coming of the British Empire that the completely new system of legislation, execution and judicial activities were used and deployed. The growth of modern parliamentary institutions in India can also be traced to our struggle against foreign rule and the urge for establishing democratic institutions. So to go back to my presentation, I wish to again invite your attention to the fact that if you look into the origin of the working of the British, working of the parliamentary system in India, one need to understand that it has its long history of origin. If on the one hand you have the ancient and medieval roots of the working and functioning of sabhas and samitis and the panchayats and the gram sabhas, on the other hand we also need to focus on the fact that how the modern parliamentary institutions in India are a result of their response to the foreign rules that is the British Empire. So how the discussions and debate and the contestation against the British colonialism shaped our consciousness and our understanding of the importance of representation of people's choice in the legislation that we started struggling and fighting for our own parliamentary system so that we can execute our own laws, we can legislate our own laws where our own people are representing our own voices. And it was it because of this kind of struggles and the long engagement against the British Empire that for the first time the first act that is the Charter Act of 1833 provided that the Governor General's gov government may be known as Government of India and his council as the Indian Council and introduced centralization in the legislative sphere. Now in this three things are very important. One that for the first time an Act of India of 1833, the Charter Act of 1833 which introduced for the first time the Governor General's government to be called as Government of India and thus the voice of India is going to be for the first time having some kind of articulation at least nominal or symbolic through this naming of the Governor General's government body as Government of India rather than Government of Britain. Then his council will be called as Indian Council, again the use of the term Indian here even if it is symbolic or nominal then has lots of sense and meaning in terms of giving confidence to all those people who were engaged to fight for India's independence. And the third important thing that introduced the centralization in the legislative sphere. Moving on, there was however no legislative body distinct from the executive until 1853. What was the big limitation of this Charter Act of 1833 was that still the executive and legislature were coterminous and there was no distinction between the two. It continued till 1853. With the Charter Act of 1853, 
then provides some sort of separate legislature in the form of 12 member legislative councils and now here you can see that for the first time the body of what we call as a legislature with a specific task of legislating came into picture through the charter act of 1853 and it was called as the legislature with having 12 member legislative council which included the governor general four members of his executive council the chief justice and another judge of the supreme court and others and that's how you can see that in one sense there are le executives the legislatives and the judiciary members sitting under one roof with a specific task of legislating and that's how even in the most nascent form the idea of legislation came into picture through the charter act of 1853 but very soon there was this need of changing into this charter act of 1853 and that translated into the act of 1858 we all know that the first war of independence in the year 1857 represented as the watershed moment in india's freedom struggle it was there for the first time that the british empire realized that it will be difficult to control and govern india from far off and thus they decided to have a new act of 1858 that was more of the government of india act 1858 which enacted and was perhaps the first statute this provided for the first time the real formation of government in india separate from the col uh, the colonies and the british company which was controlling and governing india and thus one after another new acts started emerging and this started giving shape to the concrete understanding of legislative bodies in india another which came into picture was indian council act of 1861 which set in motion the scheme of legislative devolution and the indian councils act of 1892 for the first time provided for the filling up of some seats in the legislative councils through elections now you can see that through the act of 1861 and then act of 1892 that some kind of devolution of the powers of the legislative bodies in india took place but soon after in 1892 you also find that for the first time some kind of indirect elections were introduced through which the member of the legislative councils are going to be elected and thus the first glimpse of the possibility of having an institution which will be representative and thus while enacting the laws will represent some voices of the people was opened through the act of 1892 the expansion of the legislative councils and the enlargement of their powers were provided by the government of india act of 1909 now this act of 1909 was again in one sense the watershed movement in the sense that it expanded the legislative council and it also enlarged the, their powers and it implemented the model into reforms then moving on we also know that the government of india act of 1919 which gave effect of montague james ford reform that it was the landmark in the constitutional history of india as it introduced a bicameral legislature at the center and introduced some elements of responsible governments in the provinces. Now this act of 1919 which is famously called a James Ford, Montague James Ford reform, they contributed two significant things. One that for the first time the idea of bicameral legislature was introduced in India. So what we know today as Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha that very idea was for the first time mooted through the 1919 act. On the other hand, this act also provided some powers to the provinces, the legislative bodies in the provinces and that is how the very first glimpse of some kind of representation of the local aspirations in the provincial assemblies also got its first representation. The central legislature consisted of the governor general and the two houses. Now because of this act of 1919, you have a new body coming up and that is the one in which the central legislature is now going to be consisted of governor general and the two houses and those two houses were named as 
legislative assembly and the council of states if you draw the parallelity of these institution to our modern day parliamentary system then you can find that go this governor general can be replaced by the president and these two houses the legislative assembly by lok sabha and council of state by rajya sabha and that's how it can be seen that 1919 introduced for the first time what in the contemporary times we know and call as indian parliament the first legislative assembly constituted under 1919 act came into being at the center in 1921 so that idea which was mooted in 1919 it formally took shape in 1921 even after the enactment of the government of india act of 1935 which introduced federal features and provincial autonomy in the system and also made provinces provisions for the distribution of legislative powers between center and provinces the constitution of the central government in india by and large remained what it was under the act of 1919 since the federal part of 1935 act never came into operation the most important legislation in this whole series of acts which were passed 1833 onward was the act of 1935 and it was called as the government of india act 1935 it introduced for the first time the autonomy to the provincial legislative bodies it also provided for the first time the two lists that is the central list for se legislative powers to the center and a separate list of uh, powers to the provinces to legislate in their own domain unfortunately this act was never implemented and the india India at that point of time under the British regime continued with the Act of 1919, but this became the bedrock of the federal system of government as it was introduced in 1947. And some of the major components and provisions which we see in our current constitutions, they were borrowed from this Act of 1935. The central legislative continued to function for over a quarter century from. a large period of time and thus we see that it was only with the with this surety which started emerging in 1940s that now india is going to get its independence that the concrete picture started emerging and it was in the constituent assembly that for the first time the in depth discussions and debate started taking shape that what will be the future of india in terms of the institutions which we are going to adopt for our political system it was during the constituent assembly debate that the first representative body of the people of india which was entrusted to function as the constitution making body for independent india commenced the momentous task on 9th of december 1946 as a truly representative institution which is going to decide the future of india the constituent assembly started working from 9th of december 1946 and this body that is the constituent assembly had this specific task of ensuring that india must decide after long deliberations of almost 3 years to have certain kind of representative institutions for both legislation as well as executive The members of the constituent assemblies were chosen through indirect elections by the members of the provincial legislative assemblies. Now here it is important to note that those members of the constituent assemblies were actually indirectly elected by the members of the provincial assemblies. And here it is also important to recall that those members of the provincial assemblies were directly elected by the people of India. And thus one can say that the constituent assembly was though in a limited sense a representative body of the will of the people and those representations were indirectly through the provincial assemblies where the members were directly elected by the common people the in indian independence act of 1947 enacted by the british parliament declared the constituent assembly to be fully sovereign body and the central legislative assembly and the council of states ceased to exist from 14th of august 1947 now it is through the indian independence act of 
that the British Parliament declared that the Constituent Assembly of India will be fully sovereign body and thus it will have the dual task of both enacting and forming the new constitution as well as also playing the role of the legislative body or the parliament. In the same way, this act also for the first time removed or with this, this uh, central legislative assembly and the council of state ceased to exist from 14th of August 1947. With the dawn of the independence on the midnight of 14th, 15th August 1947, the Constituent Assembly assumed full powers and took over as the Legislative Assembly of Independent India. So, as I mentioned earlier that the two functions of the Constituent Assembly, one that is the constitution making and legislation were clearly separated and Constituent Assembly that is the legislative commenced functioning from 17th November. 1947. The Constituent Assembly held intensive deliberations in the Central Hall of Parliament House for a long period of 2 years, 11 months and 17 days spread over 11 sessions. The constitution was adopted by we the people of India on 26th of November 1949 and the members of the Constituent Assembly appended their signature on it on 24th of January 1950. Thus, these are some of the factual issues which we need to also keep at the back of the mind in terms of both the long period in which the Constituent Assembly sat for more than 2 years, 11 months and they discussed and deliberated running through the 11 sessions of the Indian Parliament to discuss and formalize the Constitution of India and it was on the 26th of November 1949 that they finally adopted the constitution of India and it was decided that the parliamentary republic form of government will run the country. It was through this constitution and the debate and discussion within the constituent assembly that India decided to have constitutional democracy with a parliamentary system of government. The moment a country commit to this constitutional democracy with a parliamentary form of government means that the country is committed to holding regular, free and fair elections. Now, these three are the fundamentals of any parliamentary form of liberal democracy and these are, I repeat, regular elections, free elections and fair elections. Unless a country is not having these three, it cannot claim to be a liberal democratic parliamentary government. The control of the preparation of the electoral rules for the conduct of all the elections of the parliament and to the state legislatures of the elections to the office of the president and the vice presidents are vested in election commission of by the constitutions. Now, the Indian constitution not only provided this provision of fair elections and regular elections, but it also provided an institution under article 324 that is the election commission of India to ensure that the elections of all the parliament that is Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, the election of the assemblies in all the states and the elections of the pre vice president and the president needs to be held by an institution which is completely impartial and thus the constitution provided the provision of election commission of India which will be completely impartial organization to conduct all the elections. This election commission of India has comprises of now the chief election commissions and two election commissioners. The parliament from time to time makes provisions with respect to all matters relating to or in connection with elections to the parliament and the state legislatures including the preparation of electoral rules, the delimitations of constituencies and all uh, ma other matters necessary for securing the due constitution of the houses. Now, it is important to note here that the Indian constitution also provides and invest certain power to the parliament of India to have power to make provisions with respect to all the matters which are related to or in connection with the elections of the parliament and the state legislatures. And thus, 
it whether it's the issue of preparation of electoral rolls or about the delimitations of the constituencies or any other important matters which is related directly or indirectly to elections then it is finally the parliament of india which is the highest body to legislate any law related to this in addition the representation of the people act 1950 incorporates extensive provisions especially relating to disqualification of electors and the representations of the people act of 1951 which deals with the overall conduct of elections including provisions and procedures for disqualification of elected representatives on certain specified ground now you see that this representation of people act of 1950 and the representations of people act 1951 which deals with the overall conduct of elections including the provisions and provisions of disqualifications of the representatives on certain specified grounds the electoral pattern of first past the post system based on adult franchise ensures that the direct election held every 5 years are truly participatory in both form and, and content now this is another important aspect of parliamentary democracy in india that in 1947 when india got its in independence we all know that india was one of the most backward countries in the world both in terms of economic backwardness as well as social backwardness but it was the will of the people the will of its political leaders and the foresightedness of all those who were concerned about india's future that they, they decided to have this courage to go for this decision that all the adults in this country will have equal right to vote when we say that all of these are going to have equal rights to vote it means that there is not going to be any discrimination on the basis of religion race caste or gender in terms of voting even not the social status or the economic status is going to determine that who will get what value in terms of their voting rights and it was one person one vote which was enacted through the constitution of india in addition to that the provision of first past the post system was introduced it means that in the election whoever will get the highest number of vote will be declared as the winner in the elections now these two things ensure that there is going to be a large participation of the people in the election process and ultimately it strengthened the democratic roots in india it was also decided that every 5 years there is going to be the general elections and elections in state assemblies to ensure that whatever the trust people have given to the governments that needs to be mandated again and that needs to be reclaimed again every 5 years for the lok sabha elections the country is divided into 543 parliamentary constituencies and the electors all those who are 18 years and above cast one vote each for the candidates of their choice we all know that the parliament in india is primarily a bicameral legislature or having bicameral structure and the president is the integral part of indian parliament now this is something important to understand and note down that when we say indian parliament we are actually referring to three different components or three different bodies of parliament so what are those three things which constitute parliament at the top of it is the president and the two bodies or the two institutions under the president that is lok sabha and rajya sabha and these three president lok sabha and rajya sabha together constitute what we call as the parliament of india as i stated that this parliament of india is bicameral legislature when we say that india is a has bicameral legislature it precisely means that there are two main bodies who are going to represent the voices of the people and their aspirations and it consists of the president and the two houses in the form of the rajya sabha and the lok sabha 
Though the president is not a member of the either house of the parliament, he or she is an integral part of the parliament and performs certain functions relating to its proceedings. The president of the republic is directly elected by the electoral college consisting of the elected members of both the houses of parliament and the elected members of legislative assemblies of the state for a period of five years and is eligible for re-election to that office. Though the president is a constituent part of the parliament, the president does not sit or participate in the discussions in either of the two houses. Now this is again the very important crucial aspect of it that despite the fact that the president is the integral part of Indian parliament, the president is not supposed to sit in the parliament for any legislative procedures or for participation in any discussions. As part of the constitutional functions with respect to the parliament, the president summons and prorogues the two houses from time to time and also has the power to dissolve the Lok Sabha. So, in the, on the other hand, despite the fact that the president has no right to sit in the parliament or to participate in the debate and discussion, but the president has power to summon or to prorogue the two houses from to time to time and has also the ultimate power to dissolve the house. At the commencement of the first session, after each general election to the Lok Sabha and the commencement of the first session of parliament each year, the president addresses members of both the houses assembled together in the central hall of parliament house. After every general elections, the very first session is always addressed by the president. In addition to that, president also addresses the joint session of both the houses every year in the very first session of that year. There are certain other functions which the president performs under the constitution in relating to parliament. That includes the president appoints the speaker pro tem of the Lok Sabha and the acting chairman of the Rajya Sabha as and when the need arises. The president also summons the joint sitting of both the houses in case of disagreements between them on a bill. The president causes to be laid every year before the parliament the budget of the government. So, president also has immense power not only to appoint the speaker pro tem of the Lok Sabha and the acting chairman of the Rajya Sabha, but he also has the power to summon both the houses for a joint meeting and joint sitting in case there is going to be any disagreement between the two houses on a particular bill. In addition, the president causes to be laid every year before the parliament the budget of the government. If you look into the working of the Rajya Sabha, we know that the Rajya Sabha or as we it is called as the Council of States is an indirectly elected house and it consists of not more than 250 members out of which 238 members represent the states and union territories while the remaining 12 are nominated by the president for their special knowledge or practical experience in literature, science, art and social services. So, through this we can understand that what is the composition of the Rajya Sabha in the form of not more than 250 members out of which 238 members are elected from the different provinces or states and rest of the 12 members are generally appointed by the president who represents different fields of literature, science, art and social services. The members of the Rajya Sabha from each state are elected by the elected members of the legislative assembly of the respective states in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote. Now, two things are important here. The members of the Rajya Sabha are elected by the members of the state assemblies. So, in other words, the members of the Rajya Sabha are indirectly elected by the people and directly elected by the members of the legislative assembly. Second, that the election process of these members are on the basis of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote. Rajya Sabha members are chosen in such a manner as parliament may by law prescribe. The Rajya Sabha at present consists of 245 members out of which 
233 are from states and union territories and 12 are nominated. The minimum age qualifying for the members of Rajya Sabha is 30 years. Now here is a line of distinction that for Lok Sabha the minimum is as a qualifying age to contest the election is 25 while for Rajya Sabha it is the age of 30. The Rajya Sabha is a permanent body not subject to dissolution but one third of its member retire rotationally after every two years and are replaced by newly elected members. Now these three four facts are again very important. One that Rajya Sabha is a permanent body. So there is no question of dissolution of Rajya Sabha unlike Lok Sabha. Second important thing that the members of the Rajya Sabha are rotationally uh, retired after every two years and are replaced by newly elected members. The term of an individual member of the Rajya Sabha is six years. The Rajya Sabha is constituted for the first time on 3rd of April 1952 and the first sitting of the house was held on 3rd May 1952. If you look into the composition of Lok Sabha, we find that Lok Sabha as a house of the people as it, the name signifies is the body of representatives of the people. Its members are directly elected once in five years on the basis of adult suffrage. The maximum strength of the Lok Sabha as envisaged by the constitution is 552 out of which 530 members represent the states, 20 members are from union territories and two members are nominated by the president from Anglo-Indian community if the president is of the opinion that community is not adequately represented in the house. For the purpose of allocation of seats, each state is divided into territorial constituencies in such a manner that the ratio between the numbers of seats allotted to each state and population of the state is so far as practicable the same for all the states. The constitution specifically restricts any increase in the number of seats in the Lok Sabha till the year 2026. The Lok Sabha presently consists of 545 members including two nominated members. Now a few facts are important here. One that each state is divided into territorial constituencies which we call as Lok Sabha constituencies and they are divided in such a manner that the ratio between number of seats allotted to each state and the population of that state needs to be balanced or practically as same for all the states. In other words, the number of Lok Sabha MPs elected from any state is depend upon the total population. It is in that ratio that the seats are allocated to respective constituencies or states. The minimum qualifying age for membership of the Lok Sabha is 25 years and every citizen of India, male or female, who is 18 years of age is entitled to vote in the election to the Lok Sabha unless otherwise disqualified by the constitution. The Lok Sabha, unless sooner dissolved, continues for 5 years from the date appointed for its first sitting. So you can draw the difference here between the Raj Sabha and Lok Sabha. The membership of Raj Sabha has the tenure of 6 years or duration of 6 years. On the other hand, in case of Lok Sabha, the duration of the house itself is 5 years. But while a proclamation of emergency is in operation, the term of the Lok Sabha may be extended by law by the parliament for one year at a time and not exceeding in any case beyond a period of 6 months after the proclamation has ceased to operate. The first Lok Sabha was constituted on 17th of April 1952 and the house met for the first time on 13th of May 1952. So far 16 Lok Sabha elections have been constituted. As if you look into the relative roles of both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, you find that between the two houses Lok Sabha has a supremacy in financial matters. It also has the house to which the council of ministers drawn from both the houses is collectively responsible. On the other hand, Rajya Sabha has a special role in enabling parliament to legislate on a state subject if it is necessary in the national interest.
Now, this is a very specific special power which is given to the Rajya Sabha in terms of ensuring that in case of national requirement, the Rajya Sabha can legislate for the state assemblies. It has a similar power in regard to creation of an all India service common to the union and the states. In other respects, the constitution proceeds on the theory of equality of status of the two houses. Disagreements between the two houses on amendments to a bill is resolved at a joint sitting of both the houses where questions are decided by a majority vote. On the other hand, if you look into the working of the state assemblies of different provinces or states in India, you find that there are total 28 state assemblies and most of them, them are unicameral that is only the uh, Vidhan Sabha are there, but there are a few exceptions and the states like Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Odisha and Telangana. These are the states where you find that the bicameral legislatures are provided through the Indian constitutions. It means that both the upper house and the lower house are there as we have in our Indian parliamentary system in the central institutions. If you look into the functioning of the these assemblies, you find that they are similar to the parliament with one important limitation and that is that these assemblies, the state assemblies, they can function and legislate only on those subjects which are there in the state lists and some of the subjects of the concurrent list. If you look into the assessments of the parliamentary system in India, you find that as Professor Nirja Gopal Jayal has noted, while parliament has certainly changed as many non-elite groups that were formerly part of the political process now are very much included into it. Earlier, this was not the case. If you look into the decade-wise performance of the Indian parliament in 50s and 60s, even till early 70s, you find that most of the MPs were from one dominant political parties and were mostly from the dominant caste in India and they also belong to the dominant classes in India. But it was only after the first democratic upsurge of 1968 and later on the second democratic upsurge of 1980s and 90s that many other caste groups including OBCs started participating in the parliamentary system and the electoral politics and democratic processes in India. And we, we find that suddenly the contour of or the very social background of the Indian parliament started transforming. And it is in this regard that Professor Gopal Jayal argues that the non-elite groups were formally become part of the political process in India. The classic examples of these can be seen in the states of North India in UP and Bihar more so, where you find that many of the OBC communities have started participating in large number and thus the representation of these communities in the parliament increased substantially in the last three or four decades. This has also brought new policy initiatives in the last three decades. OBC reservation in higher education is a case in point that how over a period of time the increased representation of these caste groups has bargained with the parliament and has also influenced the whole process of uh, policy making in India. It has also changed the Indian uh, democratic um, process and the very nature and contour of social movements in India. In sharp contrast to most colonial societies, if you look into the working of the parliament in India, you find that it has flourished in part due to its longevity and in part its ability to absorb and innovate on wider social and cultural practices. And thus we can safely say from our experience of more than seven decades in the Indian parliamentary system that the parliament as an institution and parliament as a body which represents the voices of the people and their ethos and their aspirations that it has succeeded in articulating their anxieties and their concerns. 
parliament in india has also due to its longevity and in parts is its ability to absorb and innovate on wider social and cultural practices that it has always thrown new surprises for the political commentators and those who are trying to understand the indian parliamentary system if you go into the long term analysis of working and functioning of the indian parliament it is only has one evolution in the period of 1975 to 77 when the process of emergency thwarted or put the roadblock otherwise successful journey of democratic processes in india and if you compare the working of the indian parliament from 1950s to 1970s as one phase 1970s to 1980s or late 1980s as the second phase and post 1990s to the present decade present year then you find that in all these three phases the parliamentary democracy in india has evolved it has grown decade wise and it has matured over a period of time even during the 1990s and in the decade of 2000 when there were coalition governments in the indian parliamentary system we find that more than 24 political parties came together to form the government then to they ensured that there is going to be a stable government for almost 5 years and various kinds of experiment under the regime of nda rules or upa1 or upa2 rules we find that even the coalition experiment not only strengthened democracy in india but it also provided a new lessons to all those who otherwise think that democratic processes in india cannot succeed in the long run if you look into the the 70 years of parliamentary system and its functioning and working in india you find that it over a period of time gained so much of traction across the globe that many social thinkers political thinkers have arrived in india just to make sense of that what is the reason behind this kind of successful endeavor of indian politics and it is on this note that i would like to share a few readings uh, for your uh, consultations so some of the readings provided by glenville austin or by bhikhu parekh or pata bhanu mehta and gopal jyar i would like to request you to go through these readings and try to make sense of the parliamentary system in india in more depth thank you understanding oneself understanding others understanding society at large understanding the nature these are all driven by basic human curiosity we would all love to understand why things happen what happens what is the final outcome why certain things fail these are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge therefore knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts they have to be rooted into historical perspective they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio political reasons behind this whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences whether you talk with respect to physical sciences biological sciences social sciences that's the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us the knowledge that is segregated that is divided with respect to areas specializations all of them needs to be understood in its context and what provides the context it is the social reality 
how do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality, with the social reality, with the socio-political compulsions? Okay, how do you understand the law of nature okay, in its totality? And for doing that, you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences. Say for instance, if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria, a virus, any microbe, how it affects behavior, how it affects the organism, human being, you start looking at it from a pure biological point of view. If you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength, say for example, you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life, you are looking at things from a physical point of view. You are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body. You are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information. You are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process, why still human beings engage into it. You are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view. Why society at large admire things which has full of risk. You are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view. Why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences. You are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view. So, there are whole lot of things and then finally, you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life. Then you say you are looking at life, you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view. And this is what social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.